morning, church. As you can tell, I am not in my normal flannel attire. I am out of uniform. I am rocking our church swag. Let's go. This is the first time in my life I've preached not at a campus retreat in a t-shirt. Um, to the... Yes, yes, I like it. So, uh, it will not happen very often, but amen. So there is church swag. Uh, unfortunately, the order has closed, uh, but we will. As you can see, it really is great. Everyone is rocking it, like it's comfortable. I think it turned out really well. And so the good news for those who are, you know, struggling right now with an internal battle of jealousy, we, we want to make sure we don't allow anyone to sin. <laughs> and so we will do another order sometime at the end of summer, beginning of fall. And uh, I am being persuaded by people to add in things like joggers or long yeah. sleeve tees. We have a lot of control over what this is going to look like. So if you have an idea for an article of clothing that you would like with our brand on it, just come talk to me. <laughs> I'm not going to do socks. <laughs> I, I mean, I, there's no bad ideas except socks. Uh, <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> right, now that I say that, everyone's going to ask for socks, and I'm going to have to do socks. I know that's going to happen. But amen. Amen, guys. Well. Uh, I will say, before we jump into our sermon, uh, when Khan was sharing communion, the only thing I could think about was I saw a joke online this week that said anyone, whoever wrote the song Easy Like Sunday Morning never had to get children ready for church. Um, and that's all I could think about. Like, I was trying not to laugh because I was so far in front. I didn't want to laugh what he was sharing, but that's all I could think about this whole morning. Amen? Uh, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to continue our sermon series, Root It, as we go through the letter to the Ephesians, uh, verse by verse. And the title of today's lesson is Exploding Breadcrumbs. And um, I'll show you why in a second. Yo! <laughs> Exploding breadcrumbs. And uh, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father. God, I come to you right now, and I do thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for the ability to join together in fellowship and just feel the embrace of the fellowship. God, I do thank you that you are a God that is not silent, but that you spoke and continue to speak through your word into our lives. God, I thank you for this opportunity today to come and hear from your word, and I pray for anything I'm about to say that you do not want me to say, remove it from my lips. If there's anything that I haven't thought of, put it on my heart. So each of us may leave here knowing you greater and more equipped and willing to make you known in every home across the valley and abroad. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last Sunday. And the title of today's lesson, as I said, Exploding Breadcrumbs, it will, it will make sense. I was like, Tiara walks in and goes, Exploding Kittens! Um, It'll make sense as we talk through it. It is not a gluten-free uh, reference. There is actually a meaning behind it, but I'll explain it as we go. In Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up in verse 20. And if you remember from last week, Paul has just finished this section of prayer where Paul is praying for the church. And he's praying that they have the strength to understand the height, depth, and width of God's love. And to have an experience and an understanding of how much God loves them through all of the experiences and the situations and the circumstances that God is putting them in. And he says that his prayer is that every Christian can know the depth of God's unattainable, unimaginable, ununderstandable love. That he's like, I pray that you can know something that's never going to be fully knowable. And there's a contradiction there. And so he then goes to talk about how that's possible only through God's power. And so he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And he ends his prayer by saying, like, listen, we're, we're talking about God. The God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine. Right? And I just want to walk through this passage today. And obviously, we're only, these are the two verses from the book of Ephesians we're looking at today. right? So you don't have to take a whole lot of notes. That's okay. But I think there's a lot packed into these two verses. 
And he starts off and he says, now who, to him who is able to do. Right, this word here for able to do in Greek is actually the word dynamos. And it's where, where do you guys think we get an English word from that, right? Dynamite. Right, that God is able to. He, he has this dynamic ability, this explosive ability. Right, if you've ever been around dynamite or explosions, you know when they go off. This past July, I had the opportunity to uh, serve my community by volunteering at uh, Dorney Park during their fireworks show. And so 4th of July fireworks at Dorney Park. And normally when you see the Dorney Park fireworks, you're parked in the parking lot, like a half mile away from the fireworks, right? And they're, they're big. You, if you're driving down 22 on the 4th of July, you see the free fireworks show, right? Because you just see them, they're, they're that big. And so part of our ability to serve our community is we had volunteers walking around in safety protective gear, making sure that no brush fires were starting because these are explosives. And that allowed me to be directly under where they were launching the fireworks from. Like to the point where like my helmet was getting hit by like bits of like charred casings and explosions. And the first couple go off and they're like boom, boom, all right, and you're getting in position. And then you know at the end of the show like the real big ones start going off? And that first real big firework when I was direct, like you're looking like this to look up at them, right? When that went off, like I felt the explosion in my lungs. Like my breathing changed, like my tempo of breathing started changing based on the percussion from the explosion. That's the power of dynamite. Like, that's that word that has this massive ability to change. If you ever drive up the, the PA Turnpike into the Poconos, you have to drive through the, the, the Pocono Tunnel. That entire tunnel was made through what? Controlled dynamite. Dynamite can blow holes in mountains. And it says this word dynamos that, that we are talking about as we, as we come and we pray, as we engage the world as Christians, as we try to live this life, we are relying on the God who has dynamic power, that he is able to do incredible things. He has the ability and the strength to do miracles. That he has that strength, right? Think about that for a minute. This is, this is God. Right, we're going to open it up. We're, we're at the right size where we can actually open up sermons occasionally and treat them like Bible discussions, right? And so just raise your hand. What's your favorite miracle in the Bible? Got to raise your hand. We can't just shout out. But what's your favorite miracle in the Bible? In the back. Walking the ocean. So walking on the, Jesus walking on the water and walking on the ocean, right? Walking through the water. Walking, departing the Red Sea, just walking straight through. Russ? Uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. Raising Lazarus from the dead. Fire coming down, landing on the altar. That would be yours, Kelly. I love it. I love it. But like, fire consuming the altar with Elijah. James? Turning water into wine. Turning water into wine. We're not going to touch on why that's your favorite. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great miracle, though. There's a lot in that. There you go. God stopped the sun and the rotation of the earth for 24 hours, right? What else? I saw someone's face. They were like, that's in there? Karen? I think Jesus coming back to life. Jesus coming back to life. The resurrection, right? What else? Any other miracles? I like the feeding of the 5,000 personally. That's always a good one for me. Say again? The birth of Christ. Oh, it's a great one. The virgin's conception and birth. Amen? And, and we think of these miracles, and we all have these miracles where you see God do something dynamic. You see that this is a God who's able to, 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 to quote the changing water and the wine, he's able to molecularly change the structure of things, like on an atomic level. This is the God who's able and has the strength and the ability to rewrite the laws of nature, to rewrite the rules. This is a God that has the, within his ability the ability to do anything. That's the God that we come to, that He is a God that has dynamic power. That at any moment, God has the ability to explode a situation and change it. I think our projector just died. So we're going to turn it back on in a minute. <laughs> that was bad timing because I was going to go back into it, so amen. Um, <laughs> And so continuing on, he says it, it, he is um, he's able to do immeasurably more 
than we ask or imagine. Right, so that next word, immeasurably, in Greek, I'm not going to try to say the word because it's, it's, it's a harder one to say and I haven't studied Greek. But the word here for immeasurably means like super abundantly. It means that it's in such an excess and a capacity that we can't even fathom it. Like if you tried to measure this, it would just overflow. It'd be uncountable. It says that God has the ability, the dynamic ability, the explosive ability to not just do our wildest dreams but to do an immeasurable amount more than our greatest dreams. Did you ever think about that statement? That God says he's able to do immeasurably more, unfathomably more than the greatest reach of your imagination. Like, I don't know about you, but I have a wild imagination. Like, I can really think of some crazy things. And God's like, yeah, that's not even the tip of the iceberg of what I'm capable of doing. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 49 to look at probably my favorite example of God speaking of this immeasurably more, this super abundant ability. We had the projector turn off just to test who brings a Bible to church still. <laughs> Isaiah 49, and we're starting verse 1. And Isaiah is prophesying here and he says, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He has made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. He concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with God. I love this passage because Isaiah is speaking of kind of his struggle. And this conversation that he has with God. Where he says, listen, I know as this prophet for Israel, as this man of God, he goes, I know that I was chosen by God. That God hand-selected me, that he prepared me, that he called me, that he made me into a tool into his hands. And he goes, I've been told by God, I've been told by the word of the Lord that I'm this special instrument. And yet when I look at how that's played out in my life, how does he feel? I've labored in vain. And this is Isaiah writing later in his life after years of prophesying, after years of trying to speak to Israel and bring them to repentance and call them to the truth. And he looks backwards and, and he sees kind of the effect of all that he's done. And he goes, God, it's all been for nothing. You tell me that I'm special. You tell me that I've been hand selected. You, you tell me that I'm made for a purpose. And yet it feels like I've wasted my energy. Because Isaiah is looking and he's bringing this message of repent or perish. He's bringing a message to a nation of Israel that is worshiping idols. That is going to synagogue on Saturday, they're showing up to church, and then the very next day they're sacrificing their babies to Baal. That they worship God in one day, and then the rest of the week they worship their idols. They live lives with a fake veneer of religion, but a true reality of worldliness. And he says, I've spent my whole life preaching and speaking and believing that you've made me into this tool to bring about change, and I see no progress. On a side note, if you, if you ever feel like you're just frustrated, like, is God really using me? Study out Isaiah and Jeremiah. Forty years, and you're like, who listens to him? Like, what is the fruit of what happens? But I love God's response. In verse 5, And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be a servant to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am odd in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. What God says back to Isaiah is, you're getting frustrated because your dreams are too small. 
Because you're getting frustrated because you think the reason you're here is just to bring Israel back from the brink of collapse. He goes, no, I'm doing something even bigger through your life. He says, it's too small a thing for all of Israel to listen to you and to change. Instead, I'm trying to change what? All of the Gentiles. He says, your dreams are not big enough. That God is telling Isaiah, they says, listen, I could just make it happen where right now all of Israel listens to you and changes, but that's not what I'm trying to do. He goes, I'm going to use your message and the effect of your message to bring about the Savior of the world. That if it wasn't for the refusal to repent that Israel went through, we wouldn't have Jesus set up to evangelize the world. We wouldn't have synagogues and Torah getting out to all of the Gentile world. We wouldn't have God-fearing Gentiles everywhere that the gospel moves in the Roman Empire ready to accept the gospel and follow Jesus. And what God says to Isaiah is, I want to do something so much bigger through your life. You just have to trust me. That I think so often we feel like Isaiah and Jeremiah, we feel like, is this really working? That we're struggling, we're fighting, we're, we're sharing our faith, we're inviting people to study the Bible, we're trying to change sin in our life, we're trying to be the, the husband or the wife or the parent that God calls us to be, that, that we're trying to do the things God calls us to be. And we don't see it right away, and because we set our dreams too low, we want to quit. And yet we all know that, although Isaiah and Jeremiah may not have seen the effect they wanted in their lifetime, millions of lives have been changed through their prophecies. All of us in this room have had moments of Isaiah or Jeremiah, right? What's one of the most used scriptures in your first sit-down studying the Bible with someone? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Like how many millions of people have begun their journey with God because of what God did through Jeremiah? But I think the honest reality is many of us fail to see God doing immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Many of us fail to see these dynamic explosions of miracles because one of two reasons. Our dreams are too small or our steps are too big. That we either don't dream big enough or we don't start small enough. And what I love about this verse is when it says that God wants to do immeasurably more then we ask or imagine. He's saying, I dare you to dream big dreams. Because I dare you to dream massive, scary, intimidating dreams for what I'm going to do in your life. That God wants us to have these massive dreams that believe and pray and understand that He can do miracles. There's an old joke uh, that a father and a son walk into a local grocery store or pharmacy. And they walk up to the counter and, and the father goes to buy whatever, you know, medication or milk, whatever he's picking up for the day. And, and little Timmy, his son, is looking up and on the counter next to the cashier is this jar of candy. And it says, free handful, like free candy, please take a handful. And little Timmy is just staring at this jar. And so the, the pharmacist behind the counter says, hey, this, this is free candy, just reach in, you can take a handful. And little Timmy doesn't say anything. He just keeps staring at the jar. And so then the pharmacist, no, like seriously, you, you, it's yours. You can take it. He opens it up and like puts the jar out in front of him. And little Timmy just kind of stares at it. And, and so finally the, the pharmacist kind of grabs two big handfuls out of it and like puts it in little Timmy's bag and goes, you can take the candy. So the father and the son walk out. And the father turns to his son and he goes, what's going on? Like, why didn't you just grab a handful? Like, you, you can read, you can talk, why didn't you grab candy? And the son goes, because he had bigger hands than me. <laughs> this is God we're talking about. So often I think we set our dreams and our prayers based on our hands rather than what God can do. And what Paul is calling the church to do in Ephesians and, and what God is calling us to do today is to dream big dreams. To dream dreams based on what God can do rather than what we can do. You know, I, one of the things that I love about even the fact that we're in this room right now is we are the product of God giving people big dreams. 
Right? Many of you have heard the story, but, but even the dream to come out for Christina and I to lead a church planting in the Lehigh Valley. Like, we were at a campus retreat praying about a church to come to Lehigh Valley. I thought I was just going to be like the campus one-year challenge guy. Like, I thought it was going to be Riley. And then seven years later, God calls us out to the church, and, and we gather a team to come move out here. And, and I remember the first couple months of being here, we, we sat down and we prayed, like, where are we going to have our inaugural service? The, the first couple church meetings, we were in the Marita's home, and then we moved up here in November, or in July, and the very next day, we had house church in our house, and, and, and we're meeting these little house churches, and we're trying to figure out what we're doing, and people are moving every week, and new people are coming to the church, and, and then we're going size, and it's like 27 of us, and then 30 of us. And I remember praying with the group about where are we going to have our, like, welcome to the valley big moment. And God just put it on our heart that, like, the best place we could. And we found Iacocca Hall. And Iacocca Hall, if you don't know what it is, when you come down 378 South, there's this giant glass tower sticking off the top of South Mountain in Bethlehem. That's Iacocca Hall. And you can see all of the Lehigh Valley from it. It, it has a max capacity of, like, 300 people, 350 people, something like that. And so we step out on faith. We have this big dream that God's going to fill Iacocca Hall. And there's like 20 of us talking about this. And we're like, we're going to fill this thing. And we, we put a massive payment down on it. We're like, we're, we're going to put a huge chunk of our budget to like rent this facility for one inaugural service. We're going to get this place filled. And we're going to pray over the whole valley. We're like, you can see the entire Lehigh Valley from there. We're going to pray over it. And, and I, we all had such big faith that we were like, we need to make sure we have like RSVPs. Like we need to make sure we, we don't overpack the place. And so we set up online RSVPs, we, we get out there and we share our faith with 5,000 people, we invite sister churches from all over the East Coast to come support us, and the night before, Saturday morning, before I go to bed, before the inaugural service, we have 350 chairs set up in this massive auditorium. Guess how many people had RSVP'd to come? 30. And I was like, that, wait, that's not right, because we have more than 30 people at this point. I was like, what, what's going on? And I remember just this sinking feeling of like, oh no. And I just pictured us being in this room as I like our official faith building service and like 60 of us sitting in the middle of the room looking at all the empty chairs being like, yay. <laughs> and so Sunday morning I'm praying the whole way here and I'm just like, God, this is in your hands. God, this is a scary dream. What was I thinking? Did I make a mistake? Should we have started smaller? Like all these doubts. And I remember getting stuck on the Hill to Hill Bridge coming down 378, and I was stuck in kind of at that light for a minute, and I was praying, and I remember looking up and seeing Echo Iacocca Hall and just going, you know what, God? This dream's from you. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I trust you. And, and then we showed up, and we started getting ready, and God just brought people in. By the end of the service, we had standing room only. We were grabbing chairs. We had people lining the wall. We had 385 adults in that auditorium alone, plus another like 10 adults doing children's ministry downstairs. We ran out of communion <laughs> mid-service because, you know, I wasn't smart enough to get prepackaged communion like we have for COVID now. Like, that would have made so much more sense. Next time I ever start a church or a plant a region, we're doing that. <laughs> it's like literally as people are coming in the door, we're like, we don't have enough communion. Like, ha! Huh, and we look at some random brother, we're like, you have a car, right? He goes, yeah. I was like, drive and go buy more communion supplies. So he like rips out. It was insane. But it came from us deciding what? We're going to dream big. How big are your dreams for God? How big is your dream for what God is going to do through your life? Does that dream scare you? Because honestly, if we're going to make it about the God who's dynamically able to do more than we can even ask or imagine, it's going to scare us. And we've got to be in a place where we're willing to dream based on God's hand size rather than our own. It goes on in the final part of this verse. It says that this is the God who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to what? His power that is at work within us. It says that all of this power, all this ability to make these massive, miraculous changes happen in people's lives, in the community, and in the world around us. The ability to see God's dynamic, explosive power realized is used through who? Us. That that power is at work in our lives.
like I said, we have to dream big and start small. We're going to end in Mark chapter 6. Like I said, we're only doing two verses from Ephesians, but there's some connections here. Mark chapter 6, and, and, and we're going to look at a situation where I think God does a miracle that fulfills this passage. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 35. Jesus says, done a lot of work. They get tired. He, he tells the disciples, we're going to go to a place solitary and we're going to get some time to rest. And the crowds follow him anyway. And so they show up in this deserted area and massive amounts of people show up. And in verse 35, he starts teaching them, right? He says, by this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. And it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread to give to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. This crowd, as we'll see in a minute as we finish reading the passage, is a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. And the disciples are watching Jesus teach. They're tired and they start realizing like, oh, these people are getting hangry. Like this, this isn't going to end well. And Jesus isn't necessarily like a feel-good preacher. Like he's probably convicting them and they're getting hangry. And so the disciples are probably starting to hear the muttering and they're like, oh no, we're going we're gonna to have a riot. And so the disciples come to Jesus like, Jesus, it's getting late. We're nowhere near food. We weren't ready for these people. Like you got to send them away. Like you got to, you got to dismiss them. Church has gone on long enough. Dismiss them so they all get lunch. Because they're going to have to travel to go find food. And Jesus dreams big. He goes, no, no, no. 5,000 men plus women and children, you feed them. That Jesus has this massive dream. He's like, we're going to feed all of them. I don't know about you, but if I'm honest with myself and I put myself in the story, I'd be like, oh, he's done, lost his mind. <laughs> Like, honestly, I feel like I'd be like, because they're all there because they're tired, right? I feel like part of me would be like, we broke Jesus. <laughs> like, oh, no. Like, he's, he's having a psychotic breakdown. Like, that's a massive, scary dream. Like, you feed them. And I, I can imagine being Peter, right? Because I'm, I'm always, I, I relate a lot to Peter. I can imagine him hearing that and just kind of like looking at the crowd and being like, uh-oh. Uh, and he comes back to Jesus and they're like, that would take all of a year's wages. It's like, that, that would be so much. And, and what I love about this is Jesus has this massive dream. And the disciples try to respond by what? Taking a massive step. They're like, we'd have to buy. Like, they, they immediately start thinking about how much money that would take. They try to take this massive, huge step. Of, we're going we're gonna to have to figure out this money. We're going to have to buy all this food. And Jesus says, no, no, just start small. Go see how much you actually have. And so they go and, and they, they start small. Like, all right, we're, we're going to dream about feeding all these people. We're going to meet all these needs. Let's start with the smallest step. What resources do we have available? How much food do we currently have? So they go and they find out and they come back with what? Five loaves and two fish. And, and if you read the John account, you realize it's actually like a small boy's lunch and dinner. Like, how much do we got? Enough to feed this little kid. Right? And, like, some kids can eat a lot, but they really can't eat that much, right? And it's like, this is not a lot of food. And I love what Jesus does next. It says, Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, you know, small groups, hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to who? His disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. That Jesus has this massive dream. Based on God's power, we're going to feed all these people. We're going to serve all these needs. He goes, we're going to start small. Go find out what you have. And he says, what? I'm going to do the miracle through whose hands? Yours. He says, divide them into groups of 50. He prays. He breaks the loaves. He hands one to Peter and goes, go give that to your group of 50. And you're like, what? And so, again, imagine being the disciple. You're walking away from Jesus, holding maybe like a loaf or two, being like, okay, 
I'm going to get slaughtered here. Like these angry people are like, well, well, how am I? and you're like thinking, how are we going to do this? Like, am I going to give a little crumb here? Am I, am I going to a little crumb here? Like, is the first person getting a lot? And then they got to give a little. Like, and you're starting to doubt, like, what is God going to do here, right? But whose hands are the miracle happening through? The disciples. It says, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets, basketfuls of broken pieces of bread. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. That as they go out, the miracle happens through their hands. One person at a time. And again, if I put myself in the situation, like I can't wait to get to heaven and be able to ask the apostles, what was it like? Because I don't know. Like, part of me thinks like, as they broke it, you reach back and there's a whole loaf again. And you're like, huh? Like, maybe I'm, and you like, hand another half. Then you reach back and it's back. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Did they break it and as they handed it, it grew in front of them? Like, I don't know. But what I do know is after they decided to take that first small step of handing someone a breadcrumb, they then went to give a second breadcrumb and there was more. And they went to give a third and there was more. And, and as they did it, as they allowed God's power to work through them, their faith exploded. And not only was everyone fed, but what? There was an abundance left over. Right? The, the Greek word that I can't pronounce that, that talks about a immeasurably more, the same root word, the, just the part that means like a surplus. Rather than being like an excessive surplus, the root that just means a surplus is the same word used here. That what happens? Jesus has a big dream. He starts small. And through the small actions of the disciples, God's power produces more than enough. God's power produces more than what was needed. And I love it doesn't say everyone had a bite. It says everyone what? Ate their full. People can eat a lot of food. Especially when it's free. Am I right? <laughs> especially when you're in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the wilderness, right? Like, you do a hard workout, you can eat some food. There was more than enough. That the reality is for our lives that Jesus wants every one of us to have these massive scary dreams for how he's going to use us. For what he's going to do in my life, in your life. How he's going to change you and your character and how you're going to overcome sin. He wants us to have these massive scary dreams about how we're going to help other people change their lives and the impact we're going to have. And he wants us to have massive scary dreams about planning a region in Kutztown University. And he wants us to have massive scary dreams about people from here going on a church planting somewhere else. He wants us to have massive scary dreams about people going to ministry or becoming elders or becoming teachers or starting Hope Worldwide or locally or serving the poor. He wants us to dream things that use our gifts, talents, and experiences for his glory in a way that's intimidating. And then he wants us to do what? Start small. Again, I think the problem for many of us is we, we fail to live lives that see God's immense explosive power because we either don't dream big enough or we don't start small enough. We either set dreams that, that are capable without God or worse, we don't have a dream at all or we try to take too massive a step right away and then we get discouraged and give up. If we're going to see God's immeasurable power work in our lives, we need exploding breadcrumbs. We need dreams that understand the explosive dynamic power of God. We need dreams that understand what God can do in just a single moment. And then we need to be willing to what? Start with a breadcrumb. We need to be willing to start with just a small step. As we leave here today, the two questions I want you to ponder, and I want to encourage every one of us this week, either with your spouse, with your roommate, with your discipling partner, or with the person that you met with last week because we just had you meet random people. Oh. Oh. Amen. <laughs> Either with the person you met with last week because we had you meet random people. Whoever it is, meet with someone from the church this week, and I want you to answer these two questions. What dream is God calling you to dream? How is God trying to use your life for Him? And two, how do you start small? What's the first small step you can take towards that? What is your dynamite? And what's the breadcrumb you're going to start with? Amen, brothers and sisters, to God be the glory. I'm going to end before I break something else and let the singles, or the worship come back up and sing. <laughs>
I meant to say singers.